Hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Kenanga Investment Bank in collaboration with Bursa Malaysia and managed by our company Wellford. So today we are very excited to bring to you this topic which is start of a new cycle. So how is everybody doing on this 27th of April? Hope you all are doing fine and thank you so much for tuning in so early for this uh, webinar. And as we know that the domestic economy is recovering, um, you know, so setting the stage for very strong, possibly strong corporate earnings ahead in uh, 2021. So what risks will lie ahead? Will the path forward is going to be smooth? So today we are going to delve deeper into this topic as we invite the head of research from Kenanga Investment Bank, Mr. Ko Huat Sun, to share on this topic. All right. Now, disclaimer, whatever we share on this webinar is only for educational purpose only. In no way that, uh, you know, we give any buy or sell signal to any stock. So if you decide to buy or sell or make any investment decisions after these sessions, you do your own risk. Is that okay? Now, the, now we already have a few hundred of you on the line. So uh, without further ado, let me, uh, gives me a great honor to introduce our speaker today. So, uh, Mr. Ko Sun is a veteran in the Malaysian capital market. So he joined Kenanga Investment Bank as the head of research after 19 years in senior management capacity in the fund management industry where he held the position of chief investment officer. Now, prior to his fund management experience, he was an investment analyst with various sell-side research establishments, which include SG's Research, RHB Research, Ong & Co, and CLSA. Uh, Mr. Ko holds a Master of Business Administration from Melbourne University, Australia, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Oxford University, England. As head of research, Mr. Ko is responsible for formulating market strategy through carefully considered and timely analysis of macroeconomic and equity market conditions. So without further ado, let me just hand over the sessions to Mr. Ko. Mr. Ko, are you ready? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Shane. Thanks for the introduction. Um, All right, excellent. Is my slide up on the screen? Uh, no, you have to share your slide. Because yeah. just now I shared my slide, so your slide was stopped. Uh, okay, give me a second. Is it there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, now we are seeing your slide. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Shane. Thank you for the yeah. introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be uh, able to join in another session of uh, Equity Outlook. Uh, I think the last time we had this was, what, December, right? Yeah, okay. So it's, it's nice to, to be here again. And uh, I hope everyone is uh, safe and well uh, in these trying times. Um, uh, firstly, okay, let's let's get on to to the presentation proper. Yeah, let me scroll the slide. Okay, um, let me start with a review of the COVID issue, the COVID situation. I think most of us, it's fair to say that most of us are still concerned about. The the situation here. Um, I think it's very easy to get disheartened um, by news of uh, spikes in cases, uh, especially of late. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, cases in India on a daily basis, uh, reaching records of 300,000 uh, being reported daily. Um, we also <coughs> uh, hear of uh, news that some sort of vaccines being deployed uh, have issues with side effects and therefore some of this had, had to be paused or reviewed. Um, so, so it's e very easy to get discouraged and unsettled by these kind of developments. Um, but I think uh, it's very important for us not to lose sight of the fact that um, these vaccines do work. Because if you look at the underlying trend uh, in the number of cases, right, in countries where, um, you know, the vaccines were first deployed and, um, being administered at the fastest pace. For example, in the US and the UK, 
the trend is quite encouraging because we're seeing a fall in the number of cases from the peak in you know the winter peaks for example in the us uh, the recent winter peak was about uh, 200 250,000 per day and uh, the, the latest numbers that we're reading is less than 60,000 now in the uk uh, the, during the winter peak uh, we read as much as 60,000 <coughs> cases being reported a day and that's now down to less than 5,000 so it's encouraging because <coughs> these uh, countries where vaccines are being deployed at the fastest pace and deployed early we're seeing the results already i think in the case of india maybe there's uh, the question of uh, you know uh, uh, issues with with administering the vaccines and also probably uh, uh, the SOP is not being handled in a way it should be. And so, so it's, it's more like an isolated case uh, uh, in, in my mind. I think it's, the difference between what's happening this year and last year is that um, last year at this time, we were at the start of a global pandemic where you know, we, there's very big concerns that you know, this pandemic is going to spread globally and governments were really at a loss as to what to do. Whereas now, uh, you know, we are at an advanced stage of ha handling this crisis. Vaccines does help, as I've explained. And, uh, you know, cases like what's happening in India and even in Malaysia, we're seeing, you know, uh, recently spikes in cases are probably something quite isolated in my mind and will eventually be dealt with in, in a very positive way. Um, and I, I think the other thing that we need to note about <coughs> The, the, the vaccine is that um, although being vaccinated does not, uh, you know, uh, protect uh, the vaccinated from being infected, but in the event of the vaccinated being infected, it is highly likely that uh, the infection will not be a deadly one. So I think this is also a very, very important thing to bear in mind. What I'm trying to say here is that as vaccinations become more widespread, uh, more and more of the global population will be protected from very severe cases. And then therefore, uh, that, that, that is actually a big plus in dealing with this uh, crisis. Um, and I guess, how we, will it all end? I think it will all end with, um, you know, in a whimper, if you like, because I, I think, um, um, you know, COVID will be here uh, with us for a while longer. Um, but the difference, I think, going forward is that people will be better protected. So I think it's something we're going to be able to deal with uh, going forward. And as investors, um, I, I think we should really look upon this as a diminishing risk rather than, you know, certainly compared to last year, this, is, this risk is a lot less today than it was a year ago. Um, so I think going forward, there is hope that, you know, uh, the economy can gain traction on the way forward. Uh, and which brings me to the next slide here on the economy in Malaysia. For this year, <coughs> we are looking at a uh, economic recovery of six and a half percent. Let me get, yeah, six and a half percent GDP growth, uh, <coughs> which is a sharp turnaround from last year's uh, contraction of minus 5.6 percent. And uh, that will be driven by uh, recovery in almost every pillar of the economy, the biggest of which will be private uh, consumption. Uh, private consumption shrank about 4% last year. We see nearly 7% growth this year uh, on account of the easing of lockdowns, hopefully, uh, as the year progresses. Uh, e economic reopening, people being able to travel more, uh, especially in terms of domestic tourism. We, we hope to see that um, uh, uh, normalizing uh, probably in the second half of this year. Um, and also in terms of investment, uh, we are looking at a, a recovery from uh, minus, around about minus 14% last year to about 8% this year. Um, much of that also is being put in place by the public investments. Uh, you, you, if you recall, budget 2021 was uh, quite a generous one in the sense that uh, there was quite a lot being uh, allocated for development expenditure. In fact, uh, the number was a record high, 69 billion to be spent uh, in 2021 compared to 50 billion the year before. So that 
to be put to work this year. And lastly, not forgetting that uh, the external demand uh, or net exports is going to be a, also a major driver of growth this year. We see exports, net exports turn from minus 12 to nearly 4% this year. Uh, don't forget that our major trading partners, right, namely the US, actually China is now our biggest trading partner, uh, and the US being the second one. China is growing at a very rapid pace. Uh, Nomura has uh, projected China to grow 8.5% uh, this year. Um, in the first quarter, it was up enormous 18% uh, year on year. So that's amazing. Um, and for US, the Fed is looking at looking at 6.5% growth, consensus 5.5%. So that's amazing for a, a, an economy as, that is advanced and large as, 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 as the US. So with these two large trading partners really revving up, right? I, I think you could safely assume that, you know, the exports to these destinations will also, um, you know, go up quite a bit. Um, okay. Right, I, I think it's also, uh, pertinent to, to, to say that uh, I think the um, one reason why the economy has been able to, um, you know, um, stabilize, uh, you know, and, and also be able to weather the kind of uh, uh, storm of, of last year has, is, is in no small measure due to the government uh, putting, in, putting in all these stimulus uh, programs uh, to set a floor uh, under this you know, very weak economy. Um, just to review what happened in 2020, uh, the, the government put in a, a total of 305 billion stimulus package, uh, of which 55 billion was actually direct funding from the government, which is nearly 4% of GDP. And uh, the, these, uh, these stimulus uh, in the form of the big, actually the big part is actually the uh, uh, loan moratorium given by the banks. That's very important because it helps the, the, you know, um, um, the borrowers, especially not not just the men in the street, but also the SMEs and corporates, to to be able to uh, manage their cash flows and meet their debt of uh, financing obligations in a sort of orderly way uh, in the face of all these uh, cash flows issues. Um, so so that helped to put a a flaw under you know the the weakness in the economy. Um, I think for the men in the street, we've got uh, Bantuan Prihati National, which is actually um, the just cash handouts, aid, aid for the people. Uh, micro SMEs were helped by loans and also uh, grants. Wage subsidy was very important to keep the jobs in place um, and, and so forth. So these, these were actually in no small measure helped to set a base for the economy from which to rebound. So, so and for this year, we've got another additional 20 billion uh, from the per Makasa. Um, so these stimulus packages, packages were actually very helpful. Also helpful to helping the economy recover was the, the fact that EPF came in to offer uh, some <coughs> uh, sort of, uh, you know, withdrawal facilities in the form of ILSTARI and ICNA. Uh, ICNA was, uh, was, was actually very well used. I mean, we we the latest number we got from press reports suggest that um, a total of fifty three billion has been set aside for uh, withdrawals this year, and uh, this is on top of twenty two billion that's been withdrawn from account two under Isla Starry. So the long and short of this is that EPF for the first time uh, has is going to face a cash flow. Um, uh, deficit this year uh, to the tune of about nearly 40 billion. So, uh, but that's necessary for, you know, the, the people to be able to sustain themselves financially in the face of these difficulties. And uh, so, as I say, all these measures help, uh, you know, the people and also corporates to, um, to, to, to survive this difficult period such that going forward, we expect growth to come back six and a half, six and a half percent. And if you want to be granular about it, right? Uh, see how the GDP grow, uh, is going to uh, progress by the quarter. 
we are going, okay, we're seeing first quarter results to be uh, out probably in a, in a few weeks' time. We expect first quarter of 21 to be impacted by MCO 2.0, as we all know, uh, which was uh, imposed on the 13th of January. And uh, that will cause uh, a sequential decline in uh, GDP from the, um, the fourth quarter of last year, as well as year on year. So we are not really out of the woods yet this quarter. And even for, we are not really being very optimistic about uh, uh, the second quarter. But where we are hopeful and optimistic is in the second half, we're going to see GDP growth pick up to the tune of about 12.2% half on half and nearly 7% year on year. <clears throat> So that, that's where we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are seeing the economy grow. And in terms of uh, uh, GDP in uh, ringgit, right, in, in uh, constant ringgit terms, we're actually expecting 2021 to chart something like 1.43 trillion ringgit. And this matches uh, the 1.42 trillion that was recorded in 2019 before COVID set in. So what I'm suggesting is that we are actually uh, optimistic to the extent that, uh, you know, at 6.5% GDP growth, we are going to see a level of activity matching pre-COVID levels. Of course, 2020 has been, you know, uh, down, you know, it's a down year of minus 5.6%, but we are seeing 65 growth this year. And that's going to set the base for corporate earnings to, to recover. So, so that brings me to the next subject of corporate earnings. Um, the corporate earnings that I refer to are the uh, earnings of the FBN KLCI, uh, which is a barometer of our stock market. They are represented by 30 large uh, cap stocks in, in this market. And uh, this is how it looks like from year to year. In 2019, the KLCI de uh, delivered something like 95.2 cents per share equivalent here. Yeah? And in 2020, because of the uh, pandemic, you know, it fell to about 75.5. But in 2021, our forecast is for EPS to grow to 112.8 cents. And that represents a 49% rebound from the low base of 2020. And now the remarkable thing is this, at 112.8 cents, right? We are suggesting that corporate earnings will exceed pre-COVID levels of 95.2. And this is not just a dead cut bounce from a low base. That level is sustainable. We think that uh, 2022 uh, uh, EPS will be about 112. So we are saying that you know, there is some sort of, sort of momentum, uh, something holding up the, the, uh, the, the corporate earnings into next year, right? So let's see how these, um, <clears throat> what's driving these uh, earnings growth by sectors. I have in this chart, um, sort of a horizontal histograms of uh, EPS, uh, sorry, earnings by sectors. The one at the bottom here is the banking sector. They are the largest uh, component in the, in the index. They represent about around 31% of the weight by weight. So they matter a lot. You can see that uh, for 2021, we are looking at about 24% growth for the banking sector. The green bar, um, the green bar here against the, the brown, the brown is the 2020, so green is 2021. And that momentum, the growth momentum continues in the 2022. How is this achieved? We think that banks is going to grow by virtue of the fact that uh, loans is going to pick up uh, even during the recession of 2020, right, um, the loans growth was about 3%. So we're looking at about 5% this year. Um, and also uh, helping <coughs> banks' earnings grow would be uh, NIMS uh, recovering after severe contraction last year because of OPR cuts. And also credit costs is probably going to normalize. So that momentum is going to carry through in 2022. The other thing that the other sector that will contribute to 49% growth would be obviously healthcare. And here I'm talking about gloves. Remember there are three components 
uh, three glove components in the uh, index, namely Top Glove, Harta Lega, and Supermax. So they're going to grow amazing. This year, ASP, I think we can see already. ASP, is, uh, we can see the pipeline of orders till the third quarter or even the fourth quarter of this year. So 100% uh, growth is in the bank, right? Uh, we have penciled in a, a, a decline in ASP for 2022. So we're going to see a sharp fall as well uh, in, in 2022. Um, but again, uh, the, the fall in 2022 by due to the sector, rubber glove sector will be uh, compensated for, offset by the, the continued growth in the banks, which is why we're able to hold uh, the EPS uh, fa fairly flat for 22 over 21. Um, and this year also, we're expecting gaming, namely Genting uh, per heart to turn around. Genting Malaysia may still be settled in some losses, but a lot less losses than what they uh, uh, suffered in 2020. So turnaround in the gaming sector also helps. Uh, and building material would be press metal. I think press metal is enjoying a good ride in the sense that uh, aluminum prices are skyrocketing. I think they're above 2004 at the moment. Um, so, you know, they're going to be a beneficiary of ESP as well. So where does that leave us in terms of uh, um, target for the KLCI this year. We are looking at 1745, 1745 this year. And uh, today, I think the market closed at around 16, 1606 or thereabouts. So we are suggesting that there is a 10%, nearly 10% upside on the CI for this year. And how is this arrived at? We arrived at this by applying a forward price to earnings multiple of 15.6 times. On next year's EPS of 112, right, round up 112. So that gives us 17.45. And 15.6 times is a multiple which we think is uh, robust, uh, defensible, in the sense that without going into too much academic here, uh, I just want to tell you that 15.6 uh, times reflects an earnings risk premium of about 3.1%. Uh, or half a standard deviation above the 10-year mean. Um, this, this earnings risk premium is to reflect um, um, risks that may still be, that, we, that may be, um, has the effect of lowering valuations. You know, obviously when the risks are high, you demand higher return, right? So that, that accounts for that. I mean, there, there are risks like in, in election risks uh, maybe uh, some of us might be still concerned that we are not out of the woods yet, as far as COVID is concerned. You know, you know, sensing that risks are higher than the, the average over the last ten years. You know, you may want to. So we decided to put a, 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 a risk premium that is above mean. So that that's reflected in fifteen point six times. And fifteen point six times is also a premium over ten year mean in terms of. The, the multiple itself. The multiple over the 10 year is about 15.1, just above 15 times. And we are putting 15.6 times. The premium, the reason why we are uh, willing to pay more than normal uh, for the market is because, remember, interest rates are very low these days. We don't think interest rates will, will rise this year. Um, the risk-free rate as measured by the uh, CR by the 10-year uh, bond yields is about 3.1%. Uh, if you look at the last past 10 years or so, I think it's probably averaged closer to between 4 to 5%, right? So because cost of funds is low, uh, that justifies us putting a, uh, an above uh, mean uh, multiple to arrive at the target price. So there you go. So our top-down approach values the uh, the market at 1745. The other way to look at target levels would be to apply uh, target prices for each of the 30 component stocks, yeah, multiplied by the index shares as represented in the index. And here we arrive at a bottom-up uh, target of 1813. So what we're suggesting is that you know, the target could even rise beyond 1745. 
1813 is a number that will be uh, will be right at if you use a 3.1 percent um, MGS yield instead of 3.3 percent. So that is also something that is actually very reachable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, enough of those uh, numbers. Let's move on to uh, talk about some, yeah, some of the positive market developments that has happened recently uh, are as follows. I, I think these are very good stuff that's been happening, but not quite appreciated by the market. Uh, especially, I'm talking about the stock market here. Now, number one would be the uh, removal of Malaysia from the watch list by the FTSE Russell Committee. They have reinstated Malaysia unconditionally into the World Government Bond Index. Now, that's highly positive for MGS market because you know that um, that actually brought in you know interest in foreign interest back into the Malaysian bond market, uh, and that will help in terms of uh, that has helped because yields have been lower as, as 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 a result, and that means that the government when they go to the bond market to to to, to borrow they'll be able to do so at a lower price. I'm sorry, at a lower cost. So that, that, that's actually very helpful. The other thing that's positive for the market is the Cellcom DG merger. We think that this merger is highly positive, more likely to go through this time compared to last year when they were trying to do a regional uh, merger. This one will be a local one where they only involve Cellcom. So it's a lot more uh, straightforward, less complicated. And we see the benefits in the form of uh, uh, synergistic gains once the merger is uh, consumed and uh, management will be able to uh, uh, rationalize costs, uh, be able to uh, uh, compete, uh, sorry, probably even lower prices, hopefully, in a sustainable fashion. Uh, while maintaining margins for the for, for, for the for the outfit. But I think also not forgetting that this, in terms of the uh, um, impact on Exiata especially, it makes sense. You know, DG uh, has traditionally been, structurally has been trading at a higher multiple than, than Exiata. So by reverse, by actually injecting Cellcom into DG, they are actually extracting a higher value, having Cellcom within, embedded within a listed company that, is a, that carries a higher multiple. So even if you apply, a, say, a 20% holding company discount on its holding in DG, so because Exeata will end up holding one third of DG, the, the sum of parts valuation for Exeata is actually higher than if you know having Cellcom within itself. So I think this is actually a value boosting exercise for for Exeata. And for, for DG shareholders, you benefit because of the uh, eventual synergistic gains that should should be realized like, when when this merger uh, gets underway. It may not be a one year thing, but you know, it, over time, I think we should be able to see the, the benefits, the synergistic benefits materializing. Um, the other positive effect on the market that we've seen lately uh, sorry, rather positive news that we read has been the details of the MRT3 being uh, announced by MRT Core. Um, it's, it's good that you know some of these details have been unveiled, and um, and uh, the the details have not disappointed. In fact, I think it's surprised slightly on the positive because, uh, for example, the um, um, in terms of the length of the MRT3, it's actually uh, of, of, of greater length compared to the initial projection of 40 kilometers. It's actually going to be 50 kilometers. Um, and, and also, the, the actually, the underground portion is going to be longer. I think you're looking at about 20% uh, of, of, or, yeah, 20% 20, 20 or you're talking about um, about 10, 10 sorry, 40%, sorry, I'm talking about 20 km which is underground, which is longer than uh, initial um, estimates. So, so th there is a lot more to, to MRT3 than previously thought. And uh, we expect tenders to be called sometime in August. And uh, well, the, the awards should be out probably in the first part of uh, next year. So, so it's good to see this uh, out as well. 
And lastly, in a small way, I think banks in some restructuring is actually a very good thing. Um, but what, what, what they're going to do is basically take out uh, Takafu and, uh, uh, you know, distribute it up to the shareholders so that, you know, shareholders actually hold Takafu directly instead of via Bank Islam. That will remove the holding company discount and also list Bank Islam itself rather than under holding co. So all these are actually very positive, but the market hasn't been responding as, as it should. Perhaps it, it does reflect that the, the kind of um, cautious uh, or pessimism even that's still prevailing amongst investors at this point in time. Um, actually, speaking of uh, cautious uh, cautiousness in the market, I think uh, I just want to maybe share with you um, um, some observations in terms of fund flows, right? Uh, we've observed that uh, uh, it's the retail funds that's been putting money in the stock market uh, so far this year. Uh, we've seen outflows, especially by the foreign investors, as well as even the local uh, institutional investors, they have been an outflow of funds uh, uh, so far this year, right? So there's a lot of money in the sidelines uh, by helped by these uh, in, in institutional investors, which is actually a good thing if, if you have the patience for, uh, you know, with, with expectations that, you know, this, this money in the sidelines will be put to work later in the, in the course of the year. Um, okay, let me move to the next subject of uh, uh, risk. I, I think there's one risk that we need to be uh, uh, to keep an eye on, and that is the risk of inflation. Why is inflation important? Because inflation has implications for monetary policy uh, and for the pricing of uh, money. I mean, basically, you're talking about um, interest rates. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the higher the inflation, then the tendency would be for inflation interest rates to go up. If cost of funds go up, then therefore, you know, your risk, risk assets will valuation will come down. So that's where the risk is. There is have there have been a concern uh, since the start of this year that inflation could rise too high, too 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 rapidly, and we have seen that concern manifest itself in the form of high heightened volatility in the bond market, and the source of this volatility has been from the U.S. So I think we've got to look at what's happening in the U.S. in terms of inflation expectations. Um, okay, just a bit of background. Um, the, okay, the Fed looks at inflation in terms of core PCE, right? And at the moment, the core PCE in the U.S. is about 1.4% uh, versus the kind of the 20-year mean of about 1.84%. So it's below mean at the moment. And what the Fed is guiding the market is to expect the core PCE to rise in a very rapid fashion to 2.2% by the end of this year. Now, you're talking about a swing of 80 basis points of 0.8%. So in the scheme of this chart here, we are here 1.4%. What Jerome Powell is telling us is that do expect this number, this, this line to go up to here. 2.2%. That's a very, very steep increase here. Um, and in fact, there's about two standard deviation swing from you know 1.4 to 2.2. So in, 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 in the scheme of historic variations, right, this is actually a very, very rapid increase. So that's the kind of uh, that's a source of uh, 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 concern by, by the market, right? Um, but Okay, what, what is the market now saying? If you look at the, um, okay, in terms of uh, uh, inflation as reflected by cap, uh, the stock market, one measure which I use is US break even inflation rate uh, because it tells you the uh, expectations by the market of forward inflation. We have here uh, the US break even inflation rate from one year to 10 year. The blue line represents where we were uh, at the end of last year. And US break even inflation rate has risen to this line here currently. So um, what 
the market is telling us is that it's expecting US inflation to rise by something like 80 basis points, 75 to 80 basis points, which is exactly what the Fed has been guiding from 1.4 to 2.2, 80 basis points up. So I think we've reached a stage after a very volatile period in February and March, right? We've reached a stage when the market is now on the same page as the Fed. Yeah, there's, there's no tension between the two views, which is, which is good because that means that the market is now kind of like there's a, just a semblance of stability after a bit of volatility last couple of months. Now, the important message that we have to bear in mind is this. Even with such a large swing upwards in inflation rate, the Fed is guiding that they will leave Fed funds rate or interest rates unchanged, right? Now, that's very important because that means that your risk-free rate or your, the, 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 the number you use to value risk assets is not going to change. So that's highly positive. No, change, no, no rise in interest rates this year or even next year. And that means that interest rates will remain low, liquidity will be plentiful. And these two conditions are essential for markets to continue rising, right? So that's, that's very, very important. But I think it's, it's important for us, certainly for me, I'm going to be uh, an observer of, 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 of the US break even to see whether the market has now changed its mind, you know? I suppose a relevant question for us to ask is whether this implied forward rate can go up, you know, in the months to come. Uh, and I offer my I offer my view that it's not going to go up, and this is the reason why. One reason is because I think that the jobs market in the U.S. is still very slack. Um, unemployment in U.S. is about six percent at the moment. Uh, 4% is where full employment is. And when the jobs market shows jobless rate below 4%, that's when you start worrying as a central banker because that's when inflation starts to become a real problem. Now, if you look at the past sort of 20 years, right, the occasions when uh, uh, the jobless rate fell from 6 to 4%, uh, are periods which of about, you know, I mean, for, in going from 6 to 4% in, in the two occasions of the past, uh, within the last 20 years, it took three years to see those numbers coming down from 6 to 4. Uh, from, for example, here you can see 03 was when, uh, uh, yes, uh, just after, this is about, yeah, 2003 to 2006. Yeah, it went up from 6 to 4%. Another occasion was uh, here, 2014 to 2017. So another three years. And it was only when it fell below 4% in 2018, Jerome Powell pulled the trigger and said, I've got to raise interest rates. That was when interest rates were raised. So what I'm saying is that we are now at 6%. It's not going to happen this year. Uh, it's not going to fall to 4% this year or even next year. So in a sense, we think that inflation is not going to be a major problem this year. Um, right. Um, okay. Now, given uh, the um, sort of the market uh, environment that I've uh, described, right, how do we as investors, uh, you know, where do we put our money, um, you know? So one, one of the sectors which I like in this environment would be REITs. It's not going to be an instant performer. I think REITs will take time to recover. But I think the worst of the bad, the, the bad news with regards to REITs are actually priced in already. Um, last year was a bad year for REITs because uh, of the collapse in rental income uh, because of the uh, rental rebates that mall owners were giving to tenants. This year, we are seeing a uh, this rental income, uh, sorry, the rental rebates uh, diminishing much, much less. Um, and so you're going to see uh, recurring, sorry, the in income going up because of that this year. And, and also earlier this year, because of the, the, the 
REITs were weak because of the fears over a steepening of the yield curve because of the inflation scare. Now that the yield curve steepening is more or less stabilized. So therefore, um, you know, valuations are more or less uh, sort of uh, more stable at the moment. So going forward, we're saying that uh, rental uh, uh, income will be restored because of the uh, uh, lessening of rental rebates. And, uh, and, and also, uh, the other thing to note about REITs is that it's been a very uh, bad laggard compared to the other sectors which, has been, which were COVID victims, for example. Here, this chart, what I want to show you is that uh, uh, the SIN sector, which is where the, um, um, the gaming uh, and, and also the breweries are, they are now at these levels compared to the end of uh, uh, 2019 before COVID, right? So they've, they've gone down a lot and they've recovered quite a bit. REITs have been uh, less volatile, but over the last um, so 16 months or so, they are actually below where they were. And, and they, were, they are still, in terms of price levels, they are roughly where they were in March last year, right? Um, the worst performing ones will be hotels. Now. I think hotels will be uh, a laggard for some time to come um, because it will take a while before um, you know international travel can can be can can resume. Um, and so I, I think uh, all considered, REITs would be a, a sector worth considering if you have a say 12, 12 month uh, investment horizon. Um, and for REITs, right, if you look, this is the how the quarterly uh, earnings or realized net income has changed uh, from quarter to quarter since the first quarter of 2019. The worst is, of course, 2Q last year. Um, there was a recovery in the third quarter, but then because of uh, the spread uh, spiking up again, uh, 4, 4Q was a sequential decline. We expect first quarter, first quarter results are being uh, announced, uh, going to be announced. Some of them have actually come out already, but in the course of this uh, uh, result season, we, ex we don't expect much from uh, REITs in terms of the first quarter, but we reckon that second quarter is going to see better numbers. Yeah. And our REITs analysts project that, uh, you know, over the next two years, we are going to see a steady growth in realized an income of 16% per year over the next two years. So yeah, that's all I have for REITs. Um, and yes, uh, just let me put in a word on what to expect in terms of uh, the change in FBN KLCI's composition when FTSE rebalances the index. Um, we are quite confident that Mr. DIY will be uh, admitted into the uh, KLCI in June, and it's e okay. Two 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 stocks risk uh, uh, being uh, withdrawn from the index. It's either Sime Derby or Supermax. Um, at the moment, it looks more like Supermax, but uh, I think rubber gloves are counters are recovering, so there's a chance that Supermax will remain in the index and out goes Sime Derby. And in terms of sector recommendations, these are the ones that we, we like. We actually, as I say, we are bullish about the market, so we don't have any underweight sectors to, to uh, recommend. So the overweight ones that we like are the banks, uh, construction, uh, rubber gloves. We still have rubber gloves because we think there's oversold a lot of, and I think um, the pandemic isn't over. I, I think, like I say, COVID will probably be with us for a while longer in a, in a less deadly form and people will continue to be very vigilant uh, in terms of uh, personal hygiene and protection. So I think gloves will continue to be something consumed for, for, for a while longer. We like technology as well. Uh, there's a lot going on for technology. I think um, technology, uh, in Malaysia, we are not just a, uh, a beneficiary of the US-China trade tension where we see um, supply chain um, reorganization or, or restructuring that, that has benefited the Malaysian uh, uh, suppliers. 
but also just as much there is actually a very strong demand for chips at the moment. And it's not a supply side issue actually, it's actually a very strong demand for chips because we've seen like, for example, the trend of working from home has led to um, a, a great deal more demand for endpoint devices, you know, your, your, your laptops, your, your iPads and so forth. Um, and also there's a strong recovery in motor sales, in auto sales in, in, in China, especially. Uh, it's been a few months already where they've seen uh, positive year on year uh, growth in, in car sales, but Europe also picking up. And, and also not forgetting that EV, uh, electronic vehicles, electrical vehicles actually getting to be a bigger part of uh, car sales. And these vehicles have high electronic contents. So, um, and not forgetting 5G development is going to pick up pace. Uh, we are seeing more 5G smartphones now being, um, being sold. And I think Inari, for example, would be a beneficiary of that because they make uh, RF uh, packaging for smartphones. MPI does RF packaging for, um, you know, the, the 5G networks. And MPI is, is also going to um, supply more and more components for the, the, the automobile uh, market, which is actually very good. So there, there are a lot of a, a confluence of very, very good things happening that will boost demand for technology uh, uh, going forward. So I think I sort of end there. Maybe in, if you're keen to know uh, our top 10 picks, this is the list. The reads that we like would be Axis Read, um, KLCC. Um, construction would be Gamuda. Uh, the banks that we like would be Maybank, RHB. Um, the small caps that we like would be Paratransit and Tongguan. So um, I think with that, um, I've used about, well, about nearly 15 minutes of our time. So you've got any more questions, any questions to ask, I'll be very happy to try and answer them. All right, great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ko, for sharing with us your research. So if you have any question to ask Mr. Ko, please write in the Q&A box so that we will be able to address them. Of course, we have usually have a lot more questions that we can cope. So uh, uh, please don't type your questions in the chat box because we will uh, overlook it. Okay. For our friends here who are tuning in from YouTube, uh, you may write your question in a live chat and then we will pick some of your questions from there. All right. So the first questions we have here from Mr. KK Hua is uh, he would like to ask uh, you, Mr. Ko, like with the surging CPO prices, why is plantation sector still rated neutral? Right, okay, that's a very good question. Well, well, the reason for that is because we think that uh, CPO prices have peaked. It's about 4,200 at the moment. And uh, we actually, my, my colleague, Adrian, who covers the sector, he's of the view that uh, prices have peaked. In fact, it's peaked around about now. He's looking at prices to fall to 3,000 per ton. That's a steep fall. And we observed that in the past, right, um, um, during peaking CPO price, it tends, it's consistent because it happens, always happens at the end it's either the first quarter or the second quarter. So we think that this year is no difference. It's gonna come down. And the reason why we think prices will come down is because uh, you know, the production will, will uh, recover. In fact, for Peninsular Malaysia, we see that the production decline has reversed. And also for East Malaysia, we are starting to see uh, the, the production going up. So inventories will go up going forward. So because inventories will go up and you know the, the prices will, will should come down now. Now then you, you, you'll be asking the reason why why keep it neutral? Why not sell? Why not underweight? Now the reason is because of this. We think that uh, the market has priced in this downside potential. Uh, maybe towards three, three thousand five, three thousand three is possible. You know why? It's because um, um, you know, valuations again, price to earnings ratio, right? For plantation sector, the KL, KL plantation 
is minus one standard deviation below mean, right? So it suggests to us, is trading below mean, market is pricing in a pessimistic view on ASP prices. So if prices do fall, we don't think it's gonna fall by much, right? And the other thing, interesting thing to observe about plantation is that on the way up, uh, from 2005 to 3005, obviously, you know, uh, the, the plantation stocks went up along with prices, but beyond 3005, from 3005 to 4002, it was very muted. I think it was like uh, prices went up from 3,005 to 4,002. It's been like the past four to five months, but you see that stock prices didn't follow up, you know. And one of the reasons could be that uh, um, you know, plantation is uh, is a sector which is well invested by ins institutions traditionally, but uh, of late, right? By and large, more and more institutions are becoming very ESG sensitive, um, and and so it just may be the case that you know institutions are now no longer paying you know the kind of premium or the, the kind of price they used to pay. There is a kind of like an ESG discount, and in terms of ESG event that was negative for our market last year, it was with regards to sign plantation. Remember. The US CBP had a withdrawal um, order over some labor issue, which I think sign, sign plantation is not trying to deal with. So, you know, actually Malaysia as a whole has, has a, a kind of like a negative image in terms of uh, ESG management. Uh, it, it's, it's shown itself in, in plantation uh, and also rubber gloves, for example. You know, you've seen how top glove suffered the US CBP uh, uh, ban. Uh, because of uh, allegations of labor mismanagement and so forth. So yeah, I hope I answer your question. But if you need to buy plantation, right? Uh, I think the, 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 what's cheap would be Hapsing plant. Hapsing plant, okay. The, the beauty of Hapsing plant is that it's got maturing uh, pro, tree profiles, right? We expect uh, output growth to be quite strong uh, this year and next year. So at least that will sort of like offset any price weakness. You still, you still get your EPS growth for housing plant. Or if you want an integrated player, the cheaper one will be KLK. Yeah. Mm, okay. Thank you so much for the trade ideas. Yeah. So uh, since now that the glove is, uh, seems to be making some recovery, and then uh, we have a few questions here on gloves. So uh, Wong would like to ask like among all the glove counters, which one you prefer? Okay, good question. I was half expecting that there'll be a question on gloves. So let me let me show you an interesting table. Yeah. Okay, this is the one. Your question was how what again? Which which would I buy? Is it? Yeah, which, which which counter would you recommend? Okay, right. Here I show I hope you can see the four key glove stocks are top glove, harta lega. Supermax and Kosan. Okay, this is yesterday's closing price. And this is target price of each of those four counters. The highest upside is Harta Lega. We are looking at target price of 17 ringgit. Harta Lega is around about 11 ringgit now, 52% upside. Uh, top glove, we are looking at 15% upside. We have, we have a target price of 680 for top glove. Uh, Supermax, we are looking at 780 target price, 24% upside, and Kosan 6 ringgit, which is 27% upside. Now, these target prices, we are confident of those levels. You know why? Because if you look at, uh, okay, calendar year, look look at the last, the second last call, uh, row here, Cal calendar year EPS. Say, for example, top glove, right? We're looking at calendar year EPS of 52 cent per share. And using 680 as a target price, you're, you're buying, you're setting the target price at PE of only 13 times, right? Um, and and for at 17, 17 ringgit, Harta Lega is trading at the target PE of only 17 times. It used to be 20 over times, even before COVID, right? And Supermax target PE 12 times, 12 times also for Kosan. So 
these are based on target prices. In terms of current prices, where, 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 where these stocks are trading at is much lower. I think for, for, for top glove you're talking about, you can buy top glove today at 11 times PE, uh, next, next year's PE, yeah? So, so, yeah, I think for gloves, right, there is a concern over declining ASP in uh, FY22 next year. What we've done is that we penciled in $40, 40 per, per thousand pieces, right? Today, this, this year, we are talking about something closer to $90. So we're actually more than halving our assumptions of ESP next year. And this is how we arrive at these numbers here. Okay, so unless, you know, we can be certain that uh, ESPs will fall much lower than 40, I think gloves is a buy. And like I say, the pandemic is it's, 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 it's it's in a very milder form, but people, even after you get vaccinated, right? As I say, vaccinated individuals are not guaranteed from not getting an infection. You still be infected, but it's, 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 it's an infection that is not a sort of a very severe case. But with that kind of expectations, right? You still be very, very guarded in terms of how you, you know, uh, protect yourself against infections in the future. So gloves will continue to be used. The other concern on gloves would be uh, China, right? There is a thought that um, there's this company called INCO, I-N-T-C-O, uh, China's largest uh, uh, rubber glove, uh, glove manufacturer. And they are gonna list uh, their eight shares in Hong Kong soon. And I had a, a, a the chance to look at the prospectus just recently. I think there was concern amongst investors that uh, you know this INCO and other Chinese players is going to flood the market with a lot of gloves in the, in the, over the next few years. And I think that's very misplaced that fear. Um, for example, INCO, right, they're looking at about over the next five years, they want to um, bring online uh, production capacity of 200 billion gloves a year, in five years time, that's 20, by 2025. 200 billion uh, is four times Hata Lega. That's huge. We, well, I, for, for me, I think that's a bit stretch of the imagination, but even if, if, if they can do that, right, uh, you know, four Hata Legas in five years, uh, but I think that we can find comfort in the fact that this expansion is not going to be over the next, uh, year or so. In fact, the, in 21, they are expanding by 14 billion. In 22, it's only 5 billion. So they're only bringing in 19 billion uh, capacity online. The, the you know, the, the 180 80 billion or so is probably towards the, 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 the later half of the five-year period. So let's see whether it will materialize. But what I'm saying is that if you're invested, if you're thinking about investing gloves this year and next year, you don't worry about the INCO because you know the, the, the capacity expansion, if, if even if they can achieve what they say they're going to set up to do, it's going to be uh, later part of maybe 2024 or 2025. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I say enough about gloves. I, I'm, I'm still a believer in, in gloves. I think it's a, it's a value play. And we, we stand by our target prices here. Mm, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Cole. Yeah. Uh, I also see that there are several questions on Siltera. So uh, uh, looking at the uh, worldwide chip shortage situation, so what is your view on the DNEX and also the Siltera? Oh, I, I think I will not comment on DNEX. It's not a company that I know enough of. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the, there has been an underinvestment in in uh, in in chip uh, facilities, fab, fab, fabricators uh, over the last few years, and actually, this chip shortage is 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 a result of maybe a lack of investments in in these facilities in the past because of the slow growth. But but COVID has has caused, like I say earlier on. Um, 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 consumption behavior that has accelerated the demand for chips. You know, uh, for example, uh, work from home trend has created demand for more laptops, 
uh, smart devices, uh, apparently even gaming console, I'm told, like uh, your Nintendo, uh, demand has suddenly shot out the roof, which is why PIE is uh, having a good time now. Uh, people work from home and they play more games, you know. Um, and then, um, and then also because of more web computing, uh, you know, you're having more conference calls online, um, you know, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing creates demand for cloud computing and also data, data, data centers facilities. So demand for power management chips and so forth also go up. So uh, it's, it's, it, it, it reflects the kind of like strong demand uh, for, for, for chips, uh, electronics. I'm not forgetting also the, the, the demand from the uh, recovery in the auto sales uh, globally and also getting, we're seeing more electronic ve electrical vehicles being manufactured. So I think there is a structural, uh, quite a long-term upside for technology, yeah? So if you like technology, you, you can buy Inari. Uh, if you like DNO, uh, the supply um, LEDs and, 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 and semiconductors for cars in Europe, uh, in US globally, in fact, in China as well. Mm, okay, thank you so much, Mr. Koh. Um, now, just now you, uh, you were quite bullish on uh, banking sector. So the question by Jeremy is that uh, for banks and uh, financial institutions, will there be any significant impact on the bottom line arising from the deferment of loan servicing and through loan rescheduling uh, from a higher incidences of default and foreclosure? Okay. Yeah, I think last year was a year when the banks were marked by... Uh, provision of uh, uh, loan moratorium uh, and the bank suffered uh, what we call a day one modification loss. I think that that's largely behind us. The latest numbers we've got from talking to the banks has been that uh, the uh, those loans that are still under assistance programs, right, have uh, come down to between 10 to 15 percent depending on which bank you talk to. They, they used to be much higher. And also, I think if there's any more modification losses going forward, it'd be much less because, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the loan are being restructured in a way that, you know, will be less uh, negative on the banks. You know, I, I think the banks are trying to strike a compromise between them as lenders and also the borrowers who are in trouble. So we don't think that's going to be much more uh, damage. Uh, should, uh, yeah, I mean, banks will be more lenient and they may not, recognize uh, these assisted loans to be uh, sort of non-performing. I don't, I don't think they should. They should. Um, so um, yeah, we, we don't think it's going to be a big impact. And like I say, it, the economy is expected to recover 6.5%. And uh, with the economy recovering, then the, the risk of, uh, um, you know, the risk of uh, defaults and stuff will, will be much reduced. So, so one reason why we like banks is because we think credit cost is going to normalize. Uh, not normalize, I think that's wrong with use. Credit cost is probably going to come down because in 2020, there's been a lot of provisions, especially towards in the 4Q. Um, there's a lot of preemptive front loading, the overlays they call. Um, so a, a lot of them have there's a buffer there already. Lah. So I think going forward to this year, I think the chances are, you know, they don't have to provide as much. Yeah. Okay. If you like banks, we, 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 rec we, we would uh, recommend May Bank because May Bank has a good dividend paying capacity. They've got a track record of paying good dividends. dividends. And or RHB because they've, they've got very strong uh, CET1 uh, reserves. So they have more leeway to, to manage dividends and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, safe as well. Safe. Mm, okay, thanks for the uh, trading idea. Um, the next question is on uh, oil and gas. Like uh, Tom would like to ask, like Mr. Ko, since the economy is recovering, what is your view on oil and gas sector? Oil and gas structurally not so favorable. You know why? Because the world is turning against fossil fuel. I think even like in the car industries, right? Uh, 
government policies are uh, encouraging, discouraging fossil, you know, your traditional, uh, you know, uh, combustion engine cars, you know, they are encouraging uh, usage of EVs, for example. So, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely negative for, for um, um, oil. The other thing also is because I think supply side, OPEC is, isn't what they used to be. I mean, OPEC was very powerful. They were able to control prices, but I think they're losing that grip now. If, I think I was told that if, uh, say, Brent goes up to 75 or 80, right, you see the US shale, you know, coming, you know, turning the tap on and then, you know, that will spoil, spoil the upside. So I think there's very limited upside. To, to 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 oil price la, going forward. And then there's also the ESG concerns. Now nowadays more and more oil and gas majors are investing more of the money into renewables rather than fossil fuels. Uh, so generally we're not we're not really keen on oil and gas. Okay, no, I yeah. understand. Um, the next question is uh, by a very observant uh, attendee. Uh, he asked that, you know, in your previous recommendation of uh, KGB and Kerjaya, uh, the, uh, these two are one of your picks uh, last time. So, but uh, I don't see them in your latest list here. Are they still worth holding? Uh, so this is the question by this attendee. <laughs> right. Uh, I think I will get my analyst to talk to you, you can leave your name and your phone number. Uh, you know, call call chain. Uh, yeah, you are, if you are a customer of Kananga, call call Kananga. Uh, I'm happy to get Sam and uh, Joe to talk to you. They cover uh, Kajaya, so they can give you a lot of details. You sound like a very le uh, knowledgeable questioner, and if you can, you're so observant, down to the details. So so let me let 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 me ask. I'll ask them to. Call you just, just give me a number but kgb as i say uh K, kgb is what was the question is what's the call of it on kgb now yeah KGB. Ellington Group. we still like it we still have a outperform on kgb uh, because they are one of those uh, service providers that will kgb we have 260 type of price. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those service providers that will continue to um, service the chip manufacturers. I told you earlier on, right, on the question of Sotera, that there's a, a, a shortage of chips uh, and, and the manufacturers are going full, full, uh, going full capacity and they're even expanding the uh, production facilities to manufacture more chips. And KGB will continue to ride on that upside because it's apply, you know, the air purifying uh, uh, supply for for these front end um, manufacturers. So 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 they they they've gotten um, you know supply contracts with the likes of SMIC, and apparently you know SMIC is continue to it's going to expand further this year and next year. So the you know, demand for their gas will, will also uh, go up commensurately. Uh, yeah. Kajar Prospect, yeah, I'll get Joe to call you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, like, Lily would like to ask, like, how do you see steel and aluminum sector? Will this uptrend of commodity price be, uh, last another one to two years from now? Uh, steel. Steel, I think long bars have had a good run. Um, but I think long bars may come off. I think uh, it, it might be peaking. The reason why I say that is because the one of the reasons why long bars uh, went up in the first place was because when, when China was, uh, uh, I think China was one of the first to have uh, emerged from the COVID uh, uh, issue, the pandemic. Uh, and, and they, uh, they basically, the economy reopened and demand for long bars started going up. That's why they were replenishing inventories. So long bars shot up. And, and a lot of the uh, producers, right, 
uh, were inactive during much of 2020. So they're only starting to ramp, to, to ramp up production. So I think when the production side catches up, right, you're going to see supply coming in. And so that's when you're going to see long, long, long bars uh, start, start to weaken. If you want to buy, if you want to pay steel, we prefer flat steel. Uh, you know, the stuff that, uh, like, for example, CSC would do, uh, you know, the coral core, the, you, you know, you, you shape them into uh, sort of plates for electrical devices like um, refrigerators and so forth. That, that, that kind of uh, product. I, I think the prices are holding better. And, uh, and they're, because because flat because flat steel and long long steel they, they actually consume the same raw material iron ore uh, scrap metal um, because of better pricing for um, flat steel the flat steel players will be able to buy up more of this ore and being less and less sensitive to cost compared to the long steel buyers so I think the long steel producers margins might be squeezed because if your raw raw metal price goes up and then you have very little pricing power for the long steel bars, then your margins will come down. Whereas the flat steel people can pass on higher raw metal costs down the line. So if you want to buy uh, uh, steel, we prefer CSC steel uh, or maybe even Ulicorp. Ulicorp is also the, you know, doing, doing flat steel. So, yeah. mm, okay, thanks for the idea. Um, there's one question from YouTube would like to ask, uh, he says, Jeff would like to ask, like, how should investors approach the market if the national emergency status is uplifted or a general election is called? Should, should we reduce position or should we buy on deep? Wow, okay. Um, it's a pretty tough call because uh, to try and time entry exits uh, based on election timing is extremely tricky. I'm not sure whether anyone can reliably do so. I'm not sure even the Prime Minister himself knows when to call the election to start with. Um, you know, you have to be really long-term about investing, I think. Um, you know, if, if one is fearful of election, then avoid political sensitive stocks. I mean, you can buy technology uh, whose market is mainly uh, abroad, you know, it doesn't matter what happens in Malaysia, you know. Um, so, or, or even plantation, for example, you know, it's, it's politically not sensitive. Um, maybe you want to avoid a bit of construction, you know, if you're fearful. But uh, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that um, do do invest for the long term. Do 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 not let uh, the risk of elections, you know, derail you from being very, um, um, how do you say, certain about what you want to do with the investments. You, you know, if, if you are fearful of elections, avoid, you know, election political sensitive stocks, you know. At the end of the day, you want to be comfortable in, in your own decisions, right? You don't sleep well at night, I think. But anyway, if I have to answer questions in elections, I would say that, uh, um, well, what's the outcome? We've got Perikatan or Pakatan, uh, Parapan, you know, Anwar and Friends, or maybe more of Muhyiddin. Um, both parties, both sides of the house, we've seen them in government before. It's not parties we don't know. So in a way, that's kind of a relief. You know, it's, it's, it's two parties we know who have been in power before. And, you know, right now, if not for the emergency, we will be very tense up because it's a hung parliament, isn't it? I mean, it's a very thin majority. So one hopes that the election, when it's held, would really resolve this issue of a very, you know, a majority that's just too slim to be, to be comfortable about. So um, chances are, I, I would bet that after elections, maybe we, we can have a more, we'll have a government that's more stable. So that's good for the market, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Cole, for the question and answer session. So uh, let me tell you more about our next uh, sessions. So may I just share my screen? 
All right. So our next session for Cantrip webinar is making friends with trends. So it is happening on next Thursday, which is 6 May 2021. So I've just given you the registration link in the chat box and also in the YouTube live chat. So uh, please uh, register for this session if you want to know how to do trend following. You know, as you know, uh, big bucks are made on trends and strong trend means uh, make, help you to make strong uh, return and then a uh, weak trend help you to make weak return. So in this case, right, uh, making friends with trends, we are going to explore and delve deeper into the trend following strategy. So if you want to learn trend following strategy, uh, do register for this making friends with trends session happening next Thursday. So uh, after this making friends with trends sessions on the 11 May, we have this session with live chat with Tongguan Industries Berhad, innovation for sustainable efficiency. Uh, just now in Q&A, right, I see that there are people who ask about uh, Tongguan. Now, if you uh, want to learn more about Tongguan Industries, Berhad, uh, please uh, reserve your uh, calendar. 11 May uh, is the uh, Tuesday. Uh, we, will, we will be hosting the Executive Director of Tongguan Industries, uh, Mr. Elvin Ang, to come to our Kentrid webinar so he can share with you Tongguan uh, company's background, the business performance, as well as the uh, future plan ahead. So for those of you who have not had a Kananga trading account, so please uh, fill up this online form, www.cantrade.com.my forward slash open dash account dash form uh, to, uh, to put in your interest. So uh, when you put in your interest to open an account, then uh, Kananga will arrange a friendly dealer representative to attend to your request for an account opening. So with that, I want to thank all of you for, for tuning in to this uh, Cantrade webinar. Uh, we also want to thank our honorary speaker, Mr. Ko, the head of uh, research from Kananga Investment Bank for, for sharing with us your research insights so that we know uh, how to plan our you know, investing strategy ahead and what sectors should we put our attention on. I think just now you have given us many great ideas about what sectors and what stocks to look into and uh, we really appreciate, uh, appreciate your input. Thank you so much, Mr. Ko. I hope it's helpful. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Look forward to hosting you again in our uh, next Cantrip webinar. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. All Thanks. right. Bye everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a great, pleasant uh, rest of the day. And uh, remember to stay safe, you know, protect yourself in this pandemic.